All right, so welcome everyone. And <coughs> let me introduce our speaker, Marcus, um, who's a colleague of mine at, uh, at Microsoft Research. Uh, so Marcus is a principal research engineer at MSR. And I have been interacting with him over the past several years and I've learned a lot of things about, um, about TLA Plus, about uh, specification development, and about how engineers use TLA Plus to think about specifications and to reason about systems and, and, and protocols and, uh, 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 and distributed systems. So uh, with that, I look forward to Marcus's talk. So over to you, Marcus. Yep, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, although I would have loved to do this in person, I'm a secretly a Gulab Jamun lover, and I uh, every time I go to India, I have it. Uh, purpose what's also relevant here is um, that I've been contributing to TLA Plus for more than a decade now, um, and for the last eight years, like Akash says, um, for Microsoft. Okay, and today I'm going to talk like broadly about um, all things TLA Plus, the tools, the language, the application. Um, but let's start with the language. So disclaimer here, um, TLA plus is not a programming language. Uh, we call it a specification language. So you can't execute the specification once you've written in the data center uh, on your computer, you still have to write a program. Um, the fundamental idea of specification languages and with that TLA plus is in the family of, of state-based uh, state modeling languages such as ASM, V, uh, Z, BDM, and so on, is kind of like adopting what other engineering disciplines do. They build models before they build the real thing, right? Bridge builders first build a model of a bridge before they go down to the water to lay foundations. That's what, what TLA plus is. We model the system. And then because this language has precise semantics compared to modeling in a Word document or in UML, we can also verify it. We get formal verification on top of it, sort of as icing on the cake. And um, typically people like to use it for reactive systems, concurrent and distributed ones. That's what TLA plus is best suited for, which is sort of um, uh, to be expected, given that Leslie Lamport came up with it, with it more than two decades ago after having worked on concurrent and distributed systems for many, many years. Lamport's key observation that sort of led him to come up with TLA and now note the absent of the plus, the plus will come in later. So TLA itself, the temporal logic of actions, is inspired um, by well, is LTL, and back in the days when, when Lamport observed his colleagues use LTL to specify and reason about um, a system, the part about the correctness that worked beautifully um, in LTL, stating the correctness properties, the fairness constraints, liveness, and so on. But he also observed his colleagues struggle to axiomatically specify the underlying system. In this particular case, it was a FIFO. And at that point, he decided, okay, um, I'm going to do my own thing, TLA plus or TLA rather. <clears throat> and he could have sort of gone down the avenue where he used a programming language to model the underlying system. And then on top of that, use a temporal logic to, re uh, to state the correctness properties. He decided, he initially thought that that's what he will do, but he ended up just using TLA because that's good enough to, to model the system. But the temporal part in the language, when you describe the underlying system is pushed to the side, we don't see it. And in a nutshell, Lampard extended LTL, but also restricted it in some areas. So let's see where this happens. Remember uh, that in LTL, we only have state formulas, true or false of a state. And in TLA, we now have also action level formulas that are true or false of a pair of states. That's kind of the extension that TLA has in terms of uh, compared to, to LTL. And the restriction is when it comes to the temporal operators, where LTL has a rich bouquet of, of temporal operators. 
sometimes past operators, but future, mostly future operators, and especially a next operator in TLA plus, or in TLA rather, we really only have two uh, temporal operators, two future operators. One is the box of the always operator, and I'm pretty sure that the semantics are mostly known here, so we'll just give you an informal refresher. So box P says P holds in every state of a behavior, and a behavior is an infinite sequence of states. And then diamond P, or eventually P, says that P holds in at least one step of a behavior. Diamond box P is there is an infinite suffix of P where P holds, and box diamond P is P holds repeatedly over and over wherever. No, no matter where we are in a behavior, there's always a P state ahead of us. But in TLA, we can also um, build formulas from action predicates. Um, so we can write box A to say that the system only ever takes A step. But notice that, let's see where's my pointer, notice that we have this square A sub V here. That's important and we have to get back, get back to it later. But for the moment, it's fine to just gloss over it and just say box A says the system only ever takes A steps or diamond A, one, at least one A step occurs in the behavior. And then uh, box diamond and diamond box correspondingly. So those are sort of the semantics, informal semantics of temporal formulas in TLA+. So what does it look like if we put this together in a TLA plus specification? or a TLA, plus, TLA specification. Um, I have the, the most basic example here on the slide, the hour clock. So we describe the state, describe a state machine for the hour clock. We have a variable var, uh, HR, an initial predicate where we define the set of initial states. Uh, we don't see the values of the initial states yet because the values is what the plus part defines in TLA. And then in the next state relation, we relate the state of the system in the current state, the state of the system in the next state. And the next state is um, referred to indicated with this prime operator here. So in the next state relation, we define the values of the variables in the successor state. But there is no assignment here. It's all just equalities, all mathematical formulas, logical formulas rather. And the state machine, the system, the set of the behaviors is defined typically as the spec formula that conjoins the initial states to the next state relation, saying that we start in an initial state and we only ever take next states. Yeah, And there is this square A sub V again, which we will get back to later. And optionally, we conjoin a fairness constraint to the system if we care about the liveness aspects of it. I'm not going to unpack the F here in this talk, but it's just fairness, a liveness property. And now remember that I said that in TLA, the system and the correctness properties share one of the same language. We see it here, the safety and liveness property for this particular system here are expressed in the same language, but we see a bit more of the temporal formulas, uh, temporal operators, see the box operator and the diamond operator up here in the behavior part of the spec. We really only see the temporal part in the, the spec the spec formula, but that's just tip, that's typically just one line, whereas next is like many, many lines. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, because this the system and the correctness properties share the same language, we can write actually write this uh, theorem here that the spec implies the safety property and also the spec implies the liveness property. Um, so showing that this that the property sold for the system boils down to implication. And we have a number of proof rules with which we can prove safety properties, liveness properties, and what we'll also see refinement, which is on the next slide. And, so uh, Marcus question. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so sure. what, uh, what is that next HR? That will come up on the next slide. For oh, now, okay. just read box next. But box next is not a well-formed formula. So we have to write box square next sub H okay. sub H R, but I have a slide on that in a uh, after the refinement part. Okay, so this theorem doesn't make sense as yet, right? Um, 
so it's complete in the sense so this is a true true theorem here and um except for this part it essentially says that there are stuttering steps allowed um when you take the next step that's all we're saying but i think yeah it will make more sense once we get to the to the square sure. a sub b um just to give you a general idea how this is uh, proven so we find some inductive invariant that implies the safety property and then we show that the initial predicate initial states imply the inductive invariant and then here's the inductive step 1.2 where we start in any reachable state take one next step and show that in the next in the successor state the inductive invariant is still true and that then concludes the true uh, the proof we are we have tooling we have a proof manager um where we can uh, mechanically verify these proofs typically they get broken down into simpler proofs for the proof system by the human by the user um to the point that the backend provers accept the various proof applications obligations and everything is accepted okay and now we have our hour clock specification that really only has a big handle a clock with just a big handle that's okay uh, but not super useful so let's add also a minute handle um, to our specification and write a spec that is has an hour handle and a minute handle yeah, now we have two variables and clearly this specification refines implements uh, the hour clock specification now it's just a more detailed system uh, that does a little bit more compared to the to the high level hour clock specification and <clears throat> again because in tla plus and tla the behavior part of the system and the correctness properties share the same language we can now make the specification the higher level specification be the consequent of this implication and that way then prove that this low level specification minute clock refines or implements the high level specification and we have yet again a uh, proof rule with which we prove refinement it's pretty much the same to the previous one yeah we might have to prove the, the fairness part that the low level implies the high level fairness part otherwise it's pretty much the same Okay, and now let's let's boil down or get down to the point what what the square a sub v or in this particular case square next sub h r min means. If you think about it, the high level specification, the hour clock ticks twelve times and then it loops around, right? But the minute clock specification, before it advances its big handle, it ticks fifty nine times its minute handle. So somehow we have to allow this low level specification minute clock to do these 59 ticks before it takes one high level step. So suppose the sigma H A H C here is the high level behavior. You can see that there is a sequence, a finite sequence of so-called stuttering steps where the high level specification doesn't change its variables, but it just repeats the, cur the, current, the current state for a finite period of time during which the low level specification with the minute clock handle uh, with the minute handle keeps ticking without moving without changing its high level variable and this is exactly reflected in this square a sub v it's equivalent to a or the variables remain unchanged that's all what it's saying the consequent of TLA requiring specifications to be stuttering and sensitive is that we can't have the um, LTL next operator. No, we can't say anything about the next state. And formulas such as square A, when A is in action, uh, is not well formed. It has to be square um, uh, box square A sub V. By the way, there's also um, an angel A sub V this formula here which then says oh there is an a step and the variables change but the consequence is also that this is not a well-formed formula a valid formula this box a box angel a sub b uh Deepak does this answer the question 
Yeah, I think so. So the so I just read box A B as a kind of stuttering. Uh, if you want, you can take one <coughs> A action or <clears throat> or nothing happens. Or nothing happens. Or nothing happens. So, in terms of the high level specification here, or let's say in, in terms of the uh, where is it? Yeah, uh, the hour clock specification. It says we can take in its next step, and its next step was we update HR or nothing happens to HR. Mm -hmm. And this allows the minute clock specification to advance its, its minute variable, yeah? to tick its minute, um, to increment its minute variable to the point where then at, at 59, um, the HR clock moves forward. And then the, the two behaviors have this point where they are combined, take one forward step. OK, more questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so is this the only difference with LTL? Uh, like the box is similar to G and the diamond is yeah. similar? Yeah, 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 right. Um, um, the box is similar. Uh, the diamond is similar yeah they use different symbols um but the difference is that in tla plus formulas are stuttering and sensitive and that's why we can't have certain operators and that we can um form formulas over pairs of states because we have the prime operator so we can talk about the current and the next state and this gives us actions or transitions in different termini with different terminology uh that uh, will you unpack that a little uh, in later slides or mm, the reason why we can't have next and what an action is yeah like what does it mean so action is is uh... an action is a pair of states so in 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 all linear temporal logics right we have behavior sequences infinite sequences of states and the state is an assignment of values to variables and in an ltl we can talk about individual states um, in this in a behavior and in tla on top you can also talk about two pairs of states so every pair in this uh, sequence of states i see i see and that that is an action and that is an action exactly uh, okay. if you if you um, want to talk about state machines you would say a transition Got uh, going from one state to the other. So the main but, thing, I guess, yeah. that that matters because in LTL you have to separately specify state machine. Yeah. Uh, LTL. So, so, so. logic. Hmm? Okay, I think. Oh, I hear multiple. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, there is some cross -work. So so basically, this is the reason. Why yeah. uh, oh, no. can be specific? Oh, we get a bit of static here. Let's see. Uh, can you try again? Okay. So, so this is the reason why the system and property can be specified together. And um, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the reason um, why it can be done, but um, so the reason why, why we don't have the next operator is really only because we want specifications to be stuttering and invariant, uh, invariant under stuttering right. to do refinement. Yeah, and that's why, why at the language level, uh, it's not allowed to um, write formulas such as, uh, where is it? Such as this one, box A. That would rule out refinement. Because now we would be saying that for the high level specification in the next step something happens something specific happens like for the hour clock we would say in every state it would advance its its hour handle but that wouldn't allow the low level specification with a minute uh, handle to advance its minute handle before the the big handle can advance got it um yeah. and then the actions are really just giving us more ex, uh, expressiveness. And the fact that the 
the properties and the behavior specification share the same language allow also to use a state machine as the correctness property right because at first it looks as if tla is pretty limited when it comes to to the temporal to its temporal part right we only have two operators box and diamond that seems fairly restricted but because the right hand side uh, at the property itself can be described as a state machine we get um, a lot of expressiveness back because we can just describe a state machine that has variables perhaps a counter and so on mm -hmm. <laughs> okay thanks yep more questions so Marcus, also the no notion of refinement, can you uh, explain that again with that uh, with the hour and minute example? So we have the, high, I call the hour clock specification that just has the big handle, the high level specification, it has less detail, right? Mm -hmm. And the low level specification is the minute clock specification with two handles. It has the hour clock handle and the minute clock handle. <laughs> Excuse me um so more detail and we say that the low level specification implies the high level specification or their spec formulas which are built up from init and next so syntactically this is implication another way of looking at it is uh the high level spec defines a set of behaviors a set of sequences of states, infinite sequences of states. The low level specification also defines a set of behaviors. And this is a subset of the behaviors defined um, by the high level specification. Okay, so, so, you can, uh, so you're saying that yep. this minute clock refines uh, clock. Right. And uh, that essentially means that the sequence of of uh, the, ex the behaviors that you get are contained in the behaviors of clock. Right. So oh. the set of behaviors defined by the low level spec by minute clock is a subset of the behaviors defined by the high level specification. Where you project down to hour to get the behavior of the. Yeah, you, you, in this, in this, when you look at the at the subset, you obviously um, have to exclude the minute. Um, variable mm -hmm. right we only compare the uh, hr variable mm -hmm. okay and then sometimes uh and this is not on the slides here that's a bit more advanced sometimes the specifications don't share the same variables and then we have to come up with a refinement mapping i mean there's always a refinement mapping in the sense that the default refinement mapping maps high level variable hr to low level variable hr mm -hmm. if you have uh, disjoint variables then you have to explicitly give a refinement mapping okay okay thanks okay then i move on um so now let's talk about the plus part and i can finally say tla plus um so the plus part adds data modeling to tla everything up to here up the tla itself doesn't say anything about how data is modeled it just talks about variables that change their opaque values. So the plus part is one way to model data in TLA. And the plus adds data modeling with the help of Samuel Frankel set theory with choice. In other words, every data value in TLA plus is a set, set all, sets all the way down. It also implies that, <coughs> excuse me, um, TLA plus is untyped and that was deemed acceptable because specifications are typically short enough so that we don't have to carry the, the, the overhead of, um, of types in a modeling language where we want to do rapid prototyping, so to speak. Um, so everything is typeless. That means sometimes you write silly expressions, which then res, uh, um, cause an error when we evaluate our specifications with the tools. There are... Um, a few constructs known from programming languages. There are local definitions let in. There are case statements, if then else. We do have recursion, um, and there's a simple module system. But again, because specifications are relatively short, 
usually we have, we have one, two, three modules and not like in programming where we have dozens of classes, hundreds of classes in a big project. Okay, so then for algorithms that we typically write in pseudocode, Lampot came up with yeah, a DSL on top of um, TLA plus called Pluscal. And as you can see, it really looks like pseudocode. We have way more syntax constructs, uh, like processes, while loops, if then else, yeah, or local variables, global variables, and TLA plus all variables are global. But this plus scale, um is a leaky abstraction by design because we also get to write TLA plus. And this plus scale algorithm here gets translated by the tools into TLA plus. So it's a source to source translation from uh, Pluscal to TLA plus and the user can work with both the TLA and the Pluscal because certain things cannot be stated in, in Pluscal. It's a bit more limited when it comes to refinement. It doesn't do refinement and also fine grain fairness constraint cannot be stated easily in, in Pluscal. Where it's, where it's different from pseudocode is that in Pascal we put these labels here into our uh, pseudocode, and that defines the grain of atomicity. So for this particular algorithm, everything between put and LBL is one atomic step. And if I were to add labels on every line, then every line would be one atomic step, and there would be concurrency um, between those. So we get to define the level of atomicity in Pascal by putting, adding more and more labels into, into our algorithm. And we can have multiple processes, obviously, that it, and also um, can execute in parallel. Questions so far? No? Okay. Then I move on, and we are pretty much done with the uh, language part. When it comes to tooling verification uh, for TLA plus, there are three tools. Uh, the the most powerful one, but also the the most difficult one to use, um, is the TLA proof system, which is essentially a proof manager sitting on top of various backend provers. There are backend SMT provers hooked up to the TLA proof system, Xenon Tableau provers like Xenon, Isabel, propositional temporal logic solvers. And the proof manager accepts the proof applications from the front end, from what the user has written. We saw the, the proof rules early on the slides. The user gets to break them down into smaller chunks, smaller, easier proof applications. They get pre-processed and the proof manager sent to the back end. And if the back end um, accepts the proof, then uh, the proof manager reports back to the user that this part of the proof has been accepted. In the proof language, we can also control which prover to use, what the timeouts are. So there are certain sets, a certain set of pragmas with which we in the proof can define what we as the human think is the best backend to use. But this is uh, the most sophisticated tool in the toolbox uh, of, of TLA plus. Slightly less uh, uh, hard to work with and, and time consuming is a symbolic model checker called Apalachi that is based on Z3. It's the newest tool we have, has only been around for yeah, eight years now. It handles an interesting fragment of TLA, TLA plus, um, doesn't handle all of it. None of the tools handles all of, of TLA plus. Um, specifically here, this one doesn't handle hiding, existential, temporal existential quantification, composition of specifications and actions. Uh, in practice, more relevant is that it doesn't handle recursion, but we now have folds uh, inspired from functional programming. It also requires types. Users have to put type annotations into the specifications as, as comments that tell the tool how to translate TLA plus formulas efficiently into SM, SMT lib. And there is no support, no true support for liveness checking. There is a prototype that um, adopts the idea by Beer et al. 
where they translate liveness properties into fairness properties by adding more and more variables to the specification. Um, when I tried it out, it, it led to massive state space explosion. And yeah, safety checking is bounded model checking. So we have to give it an upper bound. How many times is it uh, supposed to, to carry out the next state relation? And the easiest, the, the most push button tool we have is TLC, an explicit state model checker that has been around for um, yeah, two decades. It defined the subclass of TLA plus that most people find useful in practice. Yeah, this was the only tool for a very long time. It also doesn't support hiding, hiding of uh, variables when we do refinement, composition of actions and specifications, but it checks safety and it checks liveness just fine. Uh, obviously, it suffers from state space explosion. Um, so sometimes people have to find more and more abstractions for TLC um, to be useful. Any questions about the tools? <coughs> Okay, then uh, let's come to the to the last part of the talk, and this will be the longest part. Uh, Akash asked me to to focus a bit more on the applications of TLA plus. So initially, I I uh, wanted to create a deck of scientific papers here as a screenshot, um, but my Photoshop skills weren't uh, up to the task. So I just searched Google Scholar for publications on TLA plus, Pluscal, TLA plus, TLA plus. Um, there are about 1,800, and we can broadly classify them into, into three groups. One is papers directly about TLA plus the language, its tools. Although the language itself hasn't been, hasn't been, hasn't been touched in recent years. It's more that we want to remove features from the language than add to it. Um, the second group, and that's the biggest group of papers uh, mentioning TLA plus or being um, about TLA plus, are applications of TLA plus, building reactive systems with TLA plus, consensus algorithms, and so on. And we will look at a few later. And then the third, third group of papers is are translations of some input language into TLA plus to benefit from the TLA plus tools we we just learned about. Um, because TLA plus is such an expressive language, it's easy to translate any language into TLA plus and then for free get its verification capabilities. Um, in terms of the industry, it's used throughout industry in various different domains. So we have the, the, the cloud providers, Oracle, AWS, Rackspace, um, that they use it to build bigger cloud systems, complex cloud systems. We have chip makers such as ARM and Intel. Intel used it 20 years ago to go from a TLA plus spec to RTL. Um, we have Thales from the safety critical um, railway domain. NVIDIA could also be on the slide here who use it as part of their autonomous driving. Um, it's, it's used for many things. I've seen people do supply chain um, modeling with it. I read a paper about smart schools that have been modeled with TLA plus, but also people use it for hardware design yeah, and cloud systems. Uh, it seems uni really universal, but uh, don't expect to find a room full of TLA plus programmers in these companies. The application of TLA plus is always super organic. It's few individuals who encounter a problem that's difficult enough where they think TLA plus can be helpful. They specify the problem in TLA plus that takes a couple of days, a week, and then they move on to, to work on the implementation, which is usually an order of magnitude, takes an order of magnitude more effort. Um, ideally, and that's where TLA plus provides the biggest bang for the buck is if you use it really before the ship has sailed, before you write an implementation. You write the specification and only then you write the implementation. This is what this uh, slide here is about, where engineers working on the successor of a real-time operating system 
um, applied a rigorous spec-driven regime where one engineer would write the TLA plus spec. That spec was handed to the implementer who translated the spec into C code. I believe it was C code. And then a third person would check if the specification and the implementation were in sync. And they attributed a 5 to 10x code reduction to the to the spec-driven development. Uh, the, 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 the predecessor of this real-time operating system, by the way, was part of one of the ESA missions to this Guri Machenko comet a couple of years ago. Um, but by far the, the most popular or prominent rather prominent um, application of TLA plus um, is at AWS, Amazon. They wrote about it in a CSEM article and the Lemo article um, in, the, in, the later, in, a, in the next year where they talk about their application of TLA plus. One system they applied it to was DynamoDB, which is a planetary scale um, database, strong consistency and eventual consistency. Um, guarantees that the user can choose from. And initially, the engineers followed software engineering best practices. Yeah, they wrote design documents. Um, they had design reviews, whiteboard um, discussions, and pen and paper proofs to convince themselves about the design. And then they applied prototyping, excessive prototyping, on which they ran testing, more and more testing. <coughs> Sorry. And things looked fine after the testing was done, but they, the engineers found that at this scale where AWS operates, we have to do better. Let's see what formal methods can do for us. So they looked at a few. Um, they liked TLA plus best. And when they specified this Dynamo replication protocol in TLA plus, TLC found a very subtle bug that requires 35 high-level steps to occur in a particular sequence um, for it to happen, for the safety violation to happen. So they were yeah, pretty surprised to find this after all this, um, uh, all these quality gates, including testing and whatnot. In the 2015 paper, they then write that, um, they sh essentially they write, we like TLA+, plus. we had greater confidence in the system, um, they applied it also to a few other systems um, that's um, discussed in the 2015 paper, but only at the level of code names. But I know, for example, that S3 was also a user of TLA+. And when I say was a user of TLA+, that's the big question. Does Amazon still use TLA+, these many years later, right? It's the design tool. And how do we make sure that the code and the specification stay in sync? Well, last year, uh, engineers who are still involved with DynamoDB um, presented at NSDI, I believe, where they write in the paper that even today, when we change the core replication protocol and add new features to it, we first do it at the level of the specification and verify that these optimizations work before they move on. Um, but yeah, since I'm not... I'm <coughs> Sorry, I'm not an uh, Amazon engineer, I'm a Microsoft engineer. So let me talk about um, us trying to apply TLA plus not before the ship has sailed and also not when the ship was still in, in shallow waters, but out on the ocean and the ship has gone under. So we applied TLA plus in the scope of a post-mortem and this, post, this, this incident um, that, uh, that happened, about the about which the postmortem um, is affected thousands of Azure customers and lasted for 28 days, after which it was mitigated by by rolling back to the previous known good good state. And it involved multiple teams and multiple services. So multiple different Azure systems are involved in in this incident. And the root cause was a very innocent looking code level change where they essentially moved from reading from one particular data location, from one particular um, data center to a different data center in hopes of making things faster. Yeah, and this change was vetted by senior engineers 
multiple engineers reviewed the change and it was accepted into the system. Um, it caused this long-lasting outage. The post-mortem itself about the outage is 3,000 words long. It includes answers to the various five uh, through the five why questions, but just the part about the, the very root cause, what went wrong here, is also very long and very involved um, at the level of pros. And we wanted to see if we can use TLA plus to come up with a more concise and more precise description of the postmortem. So we had to sort of go through this uh, word cloud um, that the postmortem was, and it had to contain a lot of terminology. And unfortunately, I can't show it to you because it's not public. Um, so we had to go to, through this word cloud, and um, many technical terms appeared in in the uh, in the postmortem. We we settled on on. A very high level, this uh, high level model um, of this postmortem, where we have essentially four four building blocks. We have a front end and a back end, and the front end wants to send a task to the back end. And the way it's done is that the front end first writes some value, some metadata into a database. It gets the acknowledgement um, that the value was written. And then it uses a service bus to send a notification to the backend that there is no work to do and that the backend has to look up the metadata under this key K here. And before the change, this arrow number five and six, they would go to India. And what the change was that it went to Europe. And now let's see how this can be modeled at the level of TLA plus. Uh, where's my spec? <clears throat> is this big enough or should I increase the size? No, I guess I can make it make it bigger. So the whole specification is uh yeah, 80, 80 light lines long. We have a bit of boilerplate up here where we instantiate um the database model, and I'm going to talk about the database model in a few minutes. To model this use case here, uh, this postmortem, we have three variables, a service bus, some front end token, and some back end value. That's the value that the, the, the back end eventually reads from the database. Initially, the service bus is empty. The back end has, re has read no value yet. There is no token, more on the token later, and also the database is empty. And then as the first step, which also includes the second step, we write the front end writes some task key into the database and some random value, task value. And the database acknowledges the write. So this is step one and two from the, uh, from the sketch. And then as the third step, the front end again writes to the service bus it enqueues this data value here in the service bus. And what's interesting here is we model the service bus just as a sequence, just as a list. Now, this is not the real service bus that was involved in the, uh, the postmortem and the incident. This is really just at the level of TLA plus a list and we append to it because the service bus is not super important in this, in this incident. And this is the... But I think the beauty is of, of modeling languages, we can leave certain things highly abstract and then add more detail where it matters. And in step number five, <coughs> that's now where the backend reads from the service bus, picks up the value, um, the key rather, and reads from the database under the default, default session consistency that Cosmos DB, the database here in this incident, provides. And if we check the specification uh, with the TLC model checker, we get the counter example that shows us what went wrong, right? Deterministically, and it's also the shortest counter example, we get um, so, sorry, an error uh, trace. Marcus, what was yep. the... 
What was the specification? Yeah. I mean, what, what was the sp property? Oh, you're right. Oh, good, good. Yeah, sorry, I, I glossed over the property. So the property is uh, an action level property. Yeah. So if the um, the length of the service bus decrements, uh, if we consume an element from the service bus, then that implies that the back end value becomes task value. And then we could technically do this over and over again, send data from the front end to the back end, and then always expect, yeah, here's the always, always expect the back end to read the task value. And this property is violated. We can see it uh, so here. task value is the one that was sent first, is it the first send? Right. Or is that this the only thing the front that end. Sent? So this, this so the so the front end writes the task value into the database hmm. under the task key and um, then uses the service bus to send the task key to the backend. Hmm. But the task key and, the and back... task value is fixed or is it changing? Um, it could be changing. Yeah, this represents task value represents lots of metadata. Yeah, some user request comes in, some big uh, in, in, in the real system, it's called a resource group. That's an Azure term. Um, it's, it's a container for multiple Azure resources. This gets created in the database for this particular user. And the task key then would be the user ID or something like that. And this user ID now gets sent to the backend via the service bus. And the, uh, the backend tries to read this resource group and all the other metadata from the Cosmos DB database. But for some reason, it fails to read um, the value from the database. Uh, it, it, even though it read from the database, it got back in um, a 404 in the, in the real system. Here in our model, it, gets, it doesn't change its value. The value be, remains no value, which then violates the property. <coughs> yeah, sorry, um, that the backend value is after a read always task value. Um, so now the question is, what has to change? Yeah, what is the fix? One thing we can do is we can change um, the specification and read under strong consistency. Let me just quickly update the spec here. I have to do it in two places, one where we write and also one where we read. So now we operate, we um, query the database under um, strong consistency. And uh, no surprise, under strong consistency, correctness is easy. Um, everything works. The system satisfies its correctness property. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, strong consistency is too, um, too expensive. So let's go back to session consistency. Because what the, what the engineers sort of missed in their change. And I think, I believe the reason is that they came up with an abstraction in the, in the real system. They came up with an abstraction of Cosmos DB to be able to exchange Cosmos DB with another system. That's why they missed the point that if you use session consistency in Cosmos DB, you have to pass on to have to use a session token. So you write to the database, you get a token back that you then subsequently use in the in the reads. And if we pass the session token to the backend, along with the message that contains the task key, and then use the real session token, uh, the system also works as expected. And that was the underlying, underlying problem of the system that caused the incident. They essentially, used the session consistency reads without the task, uh, without a token, which then conceptually is eventual consistency. As part of this work, uh, we had to write this Cosmos DB specification that models the whole Cosmos system. Well, it doesn't model all of Cosmos DB, but it models the five consistency levels of Cosmos DB. And we don't have time to go over the full specification, but it's 
it itself is only 400 lines long and it faithfully um, models Cosmos' five consistency levels plus message loss plus replica and region failure. This is all built into the system by abstracting Cosmos DB into just a global log for wh from which we can read and which we can write to under certain consistency levels. And we use um, upper and lower bounds to define the range of possible values a user or a client can read from the database. And then these reads get served non-deterministically at the level of TLA+. <coughs> Okay, but there's <clears throat> also one interesting observation here that escaped, or that also escaped the people who came up with the postmortem, namely that even in the old version that they rolled back to, there is still the same problem. That could still um, the, the read could still fail. The only reason why it fails less often, and I guess it fails. Uh, significantly less often because nobody uh, reported it is even if we read from the old location where the write the original write happened it's possible for us to hit a stale replica in this region one that hasn't replicated the data yet and then also um fail the read the the read right but um for some reason this wasn't important because the whole storage system has since been redesigned by multiple people over multiple months. So this bug that I just described is probably no longer there. And by the way, also as part of this work, we found and reported um, documentation bugs in the official Azure documentation that have since been corrected. And we also suggested to completely move away from replicas and regions in the documentation because we think it's the wrong mental model from a client perspective of a, of a distributed database, it makes more sense to just consider it a, a global log from which we can read non-deterministically and not think about the regions we read and write from. Um, but the documentation is written in a way where it talks about regions and replicas, which from our perspective, like I said, makes it a bit more difficult for the customer to understand. But they do link our specification and two other TLA plus specifications as the ultimate truth from the official um, Azure documentation. Um, yeah, at this point, it's also time to sort of give a shout out to, to MonkeyDB, and I think Akash was involved with that um, paper, um, which is kind of the same idea of um, our TLA plus specification modeling Cosmos DB, where we make these anomalies, read and write anomalies, um, we, we don't make them de um, deterministic, but at least we give the, the user a way to experience these anomalies during development. Whereas in the real system testing, we typically don't find see these anomalies because replication, the testing environment is so quick, um, so fast, happens instantaneously, um, that during testing, um, these, these anomalies don't get observed. And MonkeyDB at the code level is also a tool um, that makes them, makes them um, visible during testing. Okay, let's see. So we only have five minutes left. So I'm not sure I have enough time to talk about Raft. Um, are there questions up to this point? Oh, there's a question in the chat, but let's see. Okay, let me read out the question here. Uh, I apologize for writing my question here, but I am right to understand that two of the main components prerequisites of using TLA plus in industry are number one, in case of post design verification, we would need to have an accurate provably model that does not miss the important features of the system. Is TLA plus expressive enough to handle that? Number two, we still need to make sure that even once the abstract model has been verified, we still don't give guarantees about the actual implementation. But I perfectly understand this. Does this affect trust in the use of TLA plus in various industrial applications? 
that's those are two very good questions and i think that that's what this last part would have been about the ccf part but in the interest of time let me just work with the questions here um so yeah there is this disconnect between the implementation and the specification yeah there's the spec we call it the spec to code gap and that's just there yeah um you might model something might you might model a where you have to model b in the case of our post-mortem uh, it required a user it required us to identify what are the relevant parts here what is it we have to model do we have to model cosmos db do we have to model the service bus can we leave out irrelevant detail exceptions and whatnot user accounts and so on um typically people still get mileage out of TLA plus benefit out of TLA plus because especially if you model up front before the ship sails what you end up implementing actually works instead of implementing something where you then later find oh this doesn't actually work and we have to patch our design now we have to patch our code and change the code over and over again um but even even if you only use TLA plus at the very first stage, you obviously ideally want to use to guarantee that the code and the specification stay in sync over time, even if you update the specification or update the implementation. Yeah, Amazon used it, used the spec and the code over 10 years, over more than 10 years now. And as far as I know, Amazon only uses process to make sure that those two remain in sync. But there are a few approaches, and I have to fast forward here. Um, no. There are a few approaches that can be applied to make sure that the code and the spec stay in sync. <clears throat> One is, uh, we saw the refinement in TLA+. Plus. We could just refine, keep refining, and by adding more and more detail at every refinement level. And at some point, it's almost a one-to-one -one mapping between the high-level specification that then no longer is a high-level specification to the actual code. Um, I don't think in practice this is really relevant, um, um, or rather that it's really practical, because we lose the, the the benefits of using a high level specification language other approaches are um, code generation um colleagues at the university of british columbia work on a tool called pico where for very specific systems we can write a tla plus specification or rather a plus scale specification that gets then synthesized uh, compiled into code um it works for sort of the, the systems they support in their uh, in their companion library, and it also only works when for for distributed systems because in distributed systems message passing is usually the the bottleneck, um, so the performance of the generated code doesn't matter as much. But for example, in in concurrent code. Where we really want to optimize it as much as possible i don't think that generating code with a traditional approach from a high level specification would yield um, performant enough code um another technique is that we generate test cases from the high level specification um davis et al um, explored this approach for tla plus in 2020 um I don't think they found bugs with this test case generation approach. What's more promising is to do model-based testing where we um, use the high-level specification to create to generate behaviors that we then replay at the level um, of the implementation. That was also um, explored here at Microsoft by Dominé. The problem is the overhead is that one has to write a shim layer for the implementation to control it through the behavior and that is obviously also a source of bugs or at least an investment that a project a, a, a team has to make and then another technique is obviously to just move on to a, a code level formal method that reuses the correctness properties that have been identified by 
at the level of TLA plus. Um, a thing that in a, an approach that we currently work on at the in the scope of the CCF project, um, a Microsoft project, is to do trace validation, where we, in a nutshell, record the low level um, execution. Yeah, we write a log of the low level execution, and then validate that this log can be mapped to a high level to a behavior defined by the high level specification. And if there is a discrepancy, then we know that the spec and the code have diverged. Does this answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay, so then there's another question. Let's see. No, I missed one. Uh, can we model infinite sys infinite state systems in TLA plus? I understand that uh, data modeling unt is untapped, but I'm not sure if data types such as real can be modeled in TLA plus. Um, well, we we can <coughs> we can model infinite systems in TLA plus. Um, there are no types. Every number is a natural number. That's infinite. Behaviors are also infinite. There is also support for reals. But there's a reals module in the language. Yeah, there's a definition of the reals, but the tools we have do not support the reals. Um, the model checker could be the model checkers could be extended to to handle the reals, but as of today, they are not. Um, I think the reason is that people mostly describe specify concurrent and distributed systems where. There is where reels don't play such a big role, where it's more about the concurrency, about message loss, and these kinds of problems, and not really necessarily um, um, overflows of uh, finite data types. Thank you. So in essence, while we can model infinite data structures, the problem is that since you anyway have to give a bound on your verification process, nothing's infinite. If you yes and no. Um, so for TLC, um, for the explicit state model checker, you will um so for model checking, yes. And for the um, explicit state model checker, you give one bound. Um, or bound the state space in one area and one dimension. And for the symbolic model checker, you have to bind it, um, bind it in the number of steps it takes. Um, but with a proof system, um, there is not, no necessarily an upper bound, right? You can just write um, a proof. Yeah, you're right. So in things like visible, you mean? Uh, no, you can directly write it in TLA+. Plus. The proof is written in TLA+, plus, but it then gets sent off to Isabel um, uh -huh. Isabel is the backend. So the TLA plus right. gets translated into, into Isabel for you by the proof manager. And then if Isabel manages to prove that you get the, uh, yeah. the result, the, 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 the certificate back. Right. Thanks. Um, so uh, Marcus, another question. Um, yeah. If you handle, uh, infinite state uh, systems do you uh, 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 how do you get a counter example do you ever return a counter example uh well um so for <coughs> so the proof manager will only show you the the formula it failed to it failed to prove mm -hmm. uh, we only get the the you don't get a counter okay. example back okay um okay. <coughs> Well, the model checker gives you infinite counterexample spec, for example, for, for lifeness properties, right? The counterexample to a lifeness property is an infinite behavior. Um, so in other words, there's a cycle, there's a loop somewhere that um, in which the desired property is never true. So that's so what you get back from infinite, For an infinite state Could system. be an infinite system, right. Could be an infinite state system. Right, but that's not complete, right? I mean, there could be counterexamples that are not of this type. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so it seems TLA plus has been quite successful for industry. 
strength stuff like modeling raft and pexos so what do you think are open industry relevant problems so like we can get into in academia we can get into infinite systems and all that but have you found cases in industry where tailor plus have not been up to the mark or or rather the tools that come with tla plus um, yeah, I mean, you're right. The tools can can always be made better, right? Scaling the model checking, that's uh, obviously an ongoing problem. Um, now we have a symbolic model checker in addition to an explicit state model checker, and it seems they like supplement each other. Um, that's great. That's a great um, asset for industry to check. Uh, check slightly different systems with the symbolic model checker in, a deck, in addition to checking um, the or original specification with TLC. Um, also, making the proof system more convenient, more powerful to use is something that industry would benefit from these days. One has to be you know, almost intimately familiar with the proof system to uh, use it in practice. And I'm not aware of it at least at Microsoft, a team who used the proof system um, to prove anything about their specifications. So the tooling is definitely something um, where there's a lot of room for optimizations, make them bigger, scale them up to bigger problems. Um, on the other hand, because the tools are limited, people are forced to think how they can abstract their problems more. And I think this is something we sort of want to encourage that people try to come up with high level um, representations of their problems rather than going into all details. So what we typically see is beginners of TLA plus, they write an extremely detailed specification, spend a lot of time on it, and then they model check it. The model checker falls over because it's not, can't, can't handle it. And what the users, these new users don't apply is like the small scope hypothesis, right? Uh, you want you don't want to model, want to check a model with 100 processes. You want to um, check a, um, a model with three or five processes that write one or two values. And you also don't want to add unnecessary detail to your specification. Um, and then I think what's the, the, the elephant in the room is this question, how do we connect the implementation and the specification and how do we provide tools that make sure that they are in sync this trace validation is one approach it's obviously just probabilistic right it's not formal verification um none of these approaches are really <laughs> living up to reword examples or don't give um strong guarantees um the last slide i wanted to end with was actually uh this one right um in 2023 i don't think you can end a talk without mentioning ai and what i've found on the internet and i guess you've seen this too uh many people now claim that soon we will just program in english in natural language um and i've certainly um used chat gpt and these systems to my advantage advantage and they they are like super powerful and they can do great things but especially when it comes to programming and and not just low code problems um but really um reliable systems i'm not so sure if if natural language for example can really help us as input to ai systems from which we then generate code because there's this one anecdote um, about a, a writing of Leslie Lamport, then that is that 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 people found the the part-time parliament, the paper, the original paper about Paxos, it was too mathy. It had its description was too difficult to read. So many people wanted Lamport to write a simpler paper about Paxos. So Lamport wrote Paxos made simple. Um, that's it starts with this is Paxos in plain English. And Many years later, an engineer at Amazon informed Lamport that there's one sentence in, in Paxos Made Simple that is slightly ambiguous. And because of it, there are a number of Paxos implementations on the internet that are incorrect. 
Yeah, that's just one natural prose, uh, natural language sentence in this paper. And Lampert is very good at writing papers, as we all know, even uh, even describing them in prose, which caused many bugs. And Lambert himself says that prose is not the way to precisely describe algorithms. And I think what this hints at is that we need some high level language as input for these AI systems from which we can then generate um, the system level code. And TLA plus is perhaps not the language we want to use for this kind of problem, but pseudocode math looks to me like the real input we should use uh, to program with these AI systems in the future. And then what we get out of it, can, out of the AI, can be validated against the high-level precise specification. So that's where we add the formal verification again. <laughs> so um, thanks, Marcus, for the talk. I guess uh, we're a little bit over time, um, but I, I think you know. Thanks for the wonderful talk. It's always great to to do listen to talks that describe a whole verification community rather than just uh, you know one piece of work. And so it's interesting to to listen to all of this. Thank you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye, bye. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Marcus. Yeah. Thanks, Akash.